Hello and welcome everyone. As you know, we are going through a major reset. The world has gone through a crisis unlike any we have seen in recent history. So coming out of this crisis, we will see some businesses really do well and come out as winners. And there will be others that won't really do so well and won't succeed in this uh, uh, new normal. So we want to take this opportunity to truly help you get successful for the new normal. So in today's webinar, we will discuss strategies to help you accelerate the pace of your growth. We will also share with you trends, market trends, consumer and shopper insights. We will also tap into the insights and what they mean from an overall business perspective. What does it mean to my business? How will that change in the new normal? That's something we will go and delve into as well. We will also touch on growth opportunities because every black swan event comes with black op with uh, opportunities for growth. We will look into this and we will try to identify those and help you tap into opportunities both that are within your core business and outside your current core business as well. So with that, my name is Nilo for Upsell and I'm the founder and CEO of G2G Impact Group. And I'll be co-hosting today's webinar with my friend and colleagues, Ken and Eric. Hey everybody, uh, I'm, I'm Ken, um, about 25 years in the consumer packaged goods business as well as 10 plus years in retail. Um, look forward to sharing some insights and information with you and we'll pass it to Eric. Good afternoon everyone, uh, I'm Eric Dimitrio. For those of you that don't know me, uh, I've got about 20 years, so not quite as much as Ken, um, but I've got a background in uh, sales, obviously, category, trade, operations, and strategies. So uh, I look forward to, to helping you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Ken. We will be tag teaming this presentation. But before diving straight into the presentation, just a few housekeeping points. This presentation and this session is being recorded. So you will definitely receive a copy of the session. But do take notes. And the reason I say that is because at the end of the session, we will have sufficient time for Q&A and we will do a discussion. We will follow up with questions with you guys. So do take notes and at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A section. Go into that as we go through this presentation, type out your questions before you forget it and we will pick it up from there and uh, we will address as many as we can and if not all, as many as we can at the end of this session. So with that said, let's, take a look at the key takeaways. If I were to summarize this webinar in one sentence, just one sentence, I want to say businesses get ready for the gold rush because we are looking at this as a huge opportunity. Uh, when you look at growth, when you're looking for opportunities to take yourself to the next level of growth, this is that time. And you will be able to use this opportunity to reinvent yourself, revive your business, and you can do that by focusing on four key areas. Understanding what the new normal will be and uh, what it means to your overall business, remapping your current business, innovating and expanding into new growth areas, and most importantly, creating a mindset shift. A mindset shift from a culture perspective, from a leadership perspective, processes, systems, all of these that tie in with making a business successful. So these are the areas that we're going to try and cover today. And like I said, if you were to summarize this uh, webinar in one sentence, get ready for the gold rush. Lots of opportunities out there. And if you want to come out of this uh, crisis as a winner, this is the time. So let's take a step back. Let's take a step back and look at the various stages of a crisis. You know, we've gone through five different stages uh, uh, in previous uh, crises as well. So let's take a look at the first stage. The first stage is denial. This is where the predominant sentiment was shock. Then we moved into anxiety. The need to protect ourselves and our loved ones was key and top of mind for us. We were stockpiling on essentials. We were trying to stock up on enough toilet paper to last us a couple of years at least. And then as one week rolled into another and then yet another, we started to adjust. We figured out quickly how to work from home. We tried to uh, uh, have our kids around and yet we find ways to keep them entertained and homeschooled as well. 
And of course, uh, as that progressed, we started to reevaluate our expenses as well because we got this feeling that we are in this for the long haul and there is going to be uncertainty for a long period. So as the curve has started to flatten in some regions, there is talk of reopening. This is the stage where we are reevaluating everything. This is the stage where we are starting to peer into the unknown and trying to figure out what the new normal will look like. And we're trying to see what the other side of this crisis will be for us as people, as society, and as businesses. But one thing is definitely certain, and that is the new normal will not be the same as the normal of recent years. What we have to realize is that the shifts in consumer behavior that have become so ingrained as part of our uh, everyday life, as a part of our society, are going to become permanent. And these are uh, habits that have come about as a result of a really severe and really fast uh, uh, pace of change that we saw as a result of this black swan event. It touched pretty much every single aspect of our life, physical, financial, mental, social, you name it, in some shape or form, we have been touched. And of course, a number of inconvenient truths have come to light as well. Things that we had brushed under the carpet are now out in the open. The way we have been caring for our seniors, the cracks in our healthcare system, those are areas now I'm hoping will start to see major changes for the better. So to simplify uh, uh, and start looking at what's happening out there, we started monitoring, researching, and listening to all of those trends that are being put out there uh, in the social space, as well as uh, the research that's being done by multiple, multiple organizations. After curating it, we came up with this big, nice, beautiful word cloud. Hey, but this doesn't help us. So what we decided is to group the shifts in consumer behavior into six key categories. Health and hygiene, redefining spending, the DIY revolution, physical distancing, connection and empathy, and the last one, nesting and slow living. So these are the six areas we'll go into one by one, and I'll walk you through these uh, in the next coming slides. So starting off with health and hygiene. Early on in the crisis, households were stocking up on cleaning supplies. We saw a huge surge in sales. In fact, a number of categories saw a significant uptick in sales and were sold out. But what we also need to realize is that even in the pre-COVID period, health and well-being was an emerging purchase motivator. It was still pretty important. But now it's going to be on steroids. Now it's going to be table stakes, regardless of which industry you're in. Product-centric, manufacturing, service, education, uh, uh, food service, it's going to impact the entire spectrum of our society as a whole. And every single business will have to have health and hygiene front and center at the forefront. So the second uh, thing that I want to call out is around the reduction in spending levels. So the economic downturn, we are all aware of the highest unemployment rates that we have seen in recent history crop up and creep up in both US and Canada. The numbers that we're seeing here are as of May 8th that were released by both US and Canada. That we are in Canada at a 13% unemployment rate with the US uh, almost getting to the 15% mark. What this means from a spending level, Analysts are predicting that there will be about a 40 to 50% decline in discretionary spending. And when consumers were asked, when do they think that their spending levels will go back to the normal, that is the pre-COVID period? Well, at least not for the next six months. So at least that gives us a directional sense of where everyone's head is at at this point in time. The perfect storm came about for the do-it-yourself revolution, the DIY revolution. We were all locked indoors. There was the economic downturn. People were looking to save. So what happened? Well, people started researching, and the Google trends for DIY went up significantly. And some interesting sound bites that I wanted to share with you here is 43% of pet parents, dog owners especially, are saying that they will consider switching permanently 
to dog grooming at home rather than taking the dogs to say a pet smart or a, a pet salon. 32% of parents said they will consider switching to DIY haircuts for their kids. Uh, I don't know about your kids, but mine won't let me do that for sure. But still, you know, it's interesting. Another area that's going to impact gyms uh, is, uh, and workout routines is the number of people that are saying they're not planning to rejoin a gym. We have seen a huge spike in uh, home workout equipment during this past couple of months of the lockdown. So people feel pretty comfortable, I guess, that they can continue with their uh, workout routines at home or outdoors. So 67% of people have said they will continue to have a home fitness routine and uh, not go back and rejoin a gym. So some interesting numbers. Uh, keep in mind that these are early reads of what our consumer trends are looking like. But still, this gives us a directional sense uh, regardless of where we net out from a percentage point up or down, it still gives us a directional sense that, yes, people are going to be looking for more do-it-yourself type of options. Another interesting trend that uh, is going to be the normal moving forward and definitely for the foreseeable future is around physical distancing. So I've curated some trends and some ideas uh, that we've been picking up across uh, the spectrum and wanted to have them all here together to show that it is going to be multifaceted. So things like having robots in public places, that's going to become more of an accelerated, uh, uh, take up of more of an accelerated pace. Curbside pickup, home deliveries will become more, more mainstream. Protecting our older generations, we have seen how they have been impacted, how, how deeply and uh, fatally, they have been impacted. So definitely, this will be a big focus. New, I foresee new rules and new layouts being implemented uh, to ensure that we are protecting our older generations. Work from home will most likely become more accepted and the new norm because a number of organizations have already started to make those announcements. They've realized the benefits and the cost savings from this type of uh, work structure. And of course, uh, uh, we all have missed out on eating some nice, fine cuisine, eating out. Uh, so the restaurant industry has come up with some really neat ideas, especially those that have already uh, started the reopening of their economy. I picked out just one picture here, but there are some amazing examples of ingenuity uh, out there. So if you remember the 50s and the 60s, where you would have these drive-in diners, where the wait staff would come and put uh, uh, your tray of food, uh, uh, hook it onto your uh, door uh, on both your driver's side, passenger side. So that's something that's coming to life again, I see. Uh, this example here is with planks. Uh, you roll down both your passenger and driver's side of uh, windows of your car, and they slide in this plank with your food on it. So you have a makeshift table to enjoy your uh, uh, dining experience out and still stay safe. Of course, uh, large events like trade shows and concerts uh, are being reimagined and redesigned as we get into the new normal. The next trend is actually something that I'm really happy to see. Uh, this is something that's the silver lining coming out of this crisis. The need for connection and empathy has been amped up. Unfortunately, in the recent years, we have become a bit of a empathy deficit type of a society. In this new normal, and especially during this crisis and the isolation, uh, people have started to look for connectivity, look for that empathy. Uh, shelters have, uh, are empty at this point. People have gone out and adopted pets, dogs, and cats to keep them company and uh, build that connection. Of course, I'm sure you've had at least a couple of Zoom birthday parties uh, uh, through this lockdown. I've had a few that we've had uh, in our family and with friends where we just got on Zoom and had a Zoom party. So that need for connection and empathy is very important. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why this is going to be so important for brands. In this new normal, those brands and businesses that are showing authenticity and empathy during these difficult times will be the ones that consumers and shoppers will gravitate towards. So keep this in mind, this uh, uh, soundbite around empathy and trust and loyalty, because we'll touch on that a few times during this presentation. 
because that is going to be a key a theme that you'll see across various businesses for a very long time now. And the last trend is around nesting. This is a trend that we saw in our previous recession as well, the one we went through about 10 years ago, 2008, 2009. People started cooking more at home, spending quality time at home with family and pets, more game nights with uh, kids at home. But the other thing that got added on this time around is an appreciation for slow living, uh, a relearning of our priorities and appreciating the finer things of our life and realizing that there's more to life than just uh, you know being on that fast pace. Unfortunately, we had all started thinking of being busy as being synonymous with success. It was a badge that we all proudly wanted to wear and carry around and say, hey, I am very busy. Hopefully, this change of slow living and an appreciation for uh, prioritizing the things that are important to life will continue on. So these are the six consumer behavior shifts that we are noticing. And uh, I will now hand it over to Ken to walk you through what this means from a business implications perspective. How does this morph into your brand and to, into your business? Ken, over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Nilu. Um, so what does this new normal mean to a business? You know, what are the business implications? Well, this leads me to a quote from former CEO Intel, Andy Groves. Bad companies are destroyed by crisis. Good companies survive them. Great companies are improved by them. And this is really where we want to help you with information and be prepared so that we can take our businesses and your businesses forward to the next level. So right off the bat, one thing we can all agree on is that the winners in this new normal will be those that understand the new normal. They reevaluate, remap current business models, innovate and expand to new growth areas, and have a growth mindset and a culture of growth across all areas of the business. Because to accelerate the pace of growth, every single business area will be touched by the new normal. So let's start by looking with some of the mega categories. You know, not every category is going to be the same if you're in the food business and even to some extent the overall consumer packaged goods industry, people are spending more now versus the pre-COVID area on many of these categories. You look at food, uh, you know, again, they're spending significantly more. You're seeing a net gain of about 28%. Uh, entertainment at home, you're spending a little bit more because there's fewer places to go out, yet you start to see some significant gaps in clothes, luxury goods, travel, and entertainment outside of the home because of the current existing conditions. So as a result of reduced spending, we're seeing consumer bifurcation. You've got consumers trading up and down simultaneously. All those top categories in the green, milk alternatives, baby food, pet food, teas, cough and cold medications, Consumers are switching from private label to branded players. And in the categories in the red, you're experiencing some down trading. Categories such as bottled water, yogurts, shampoo. On the other hand, when you look at some shopper demographics, Gen Z and millennials, they're willing to pay more, a significant premium for healthy food. So when you're evaluating switching trends, Take this as an opportunity to grow your sales, gain market share by retaining those shoppers that have switched to your brand and are enticing those that are on the cusp of switching to come over. 30 to 40% of consumers have tried new brands as a result of the crisis. 50% of those switched out due to out of stocks or a lack of availability either at the store they were visiting or just because they couldn't find something. And again, 20% switch based on price. 12% of those consumers though, claim they're going to continue with that new brand post pandemic. So here's the opportunity to capture the market. As you're preparing for the new normal, I'm going to suggest you start identifying a demand pattern based on a category that you're currently playing in. And we've noticed four patterns emerging as a reaction to the pandemic. The first pantry loading and consuming. This is where the consumption actually expands. So cleaning supplies, vitamins, supplements, immediate consumables, so many of those items are being purchased. They were being you know, pantry loaded, but they're going through them. The second category is that pantry load, but the preserve. 
So again, these are areas like toilet paper or pet food and some other of these categories where people went out and stocked up, but they're not changing their consumption habits. They just have more on hand because they're not sure when they'll be back into stores and be able to kind of return to normal. Third category is the now at home. And much like the previous slide, where we talked about some of those consumption shifts. It's things like coffee, alcohol, grooming, where you've gone from out of the home to in home. So now that you're kind of stuck at home, uh, based on the, the, the new existing conditions, you're traveling less, you're spending less outside of the home. So now a lot of that consumption has moved into this category. And the fourth, that not now. Here's where we're truly seeing consumption decline. Beauty, luggage, cell phones, travel. Those are the areas that you're seeing significant as people have to delay trips, delay uh, some of the higher ticket purchases, because now it's just not the right time. The question becomes, are those lost opportunities or are they just significantly delayed? And as a business, it's gonna be up to us to determine how do we go back. The way the new normal evolves will determine when and how those purchase levels will return. So given the number of scenarios that we're working with from a business perspective, we have to create different demand scenarios. This is where we're gonna be looking at our baseline business. We've gone through that stock up period and so we saw that spike. Now we've gotta go through the next two phases of social distancing and the new normal and start to plan our business out and figure out where are we going to end up. And it's important that you should have at least three scenarios. Your best case scenario, this is you know, how can we grow and what are the true opportunities? We also need to have a worst case scenario. What's going to happen if the current conditions either extend or even decline? What happens if we have to go back into a lockdown? What happens if more stores have to close after having just reopened? What's that going to do to our demand planning, our forecasting, our promotional plans, all of those things? Then we also need to kind of land somewhere in the middle with what's the most likely to occur. And so this is really important that we start planning these in two month increments and that maybe even earlier on, we're starting to look at bi-weekly increments. How are we getting these bursts and plan uh, more effectively and accurately so that we can be prepared? And one of the variables to evaluate will be the depth and need for promotional spending. We've seen a decline in promotional spend across most categories, especially in the health and personal care category, where it dropped from about 25% to down to less than 15%. So the questions we have to ask ourselves is, is there a need for price promotions when demand is inherently high? Do we need those secondary displays or are we actually going to hurt our base business because we're trying to push too much inventory that's not necessarily being consumed and it's not in its home location? How are we gonna manage replenishment if the sell-through is potentially higher or even lower than expected? These are important questions that we're going to need to be able to address specifically within a consumer-centric organization. And as you see on the screen, you're looking at a variety of the different categories. You know, you're seeing the light blue line, which is the health and personal care. You've seen some of the blips in food, which is the dark blue, and the green, which is beverage. And the significant drive behind some of that beverage is going to be the alcohol, where you're going to be the difference between kind of in-establishment versus at-home purchases. With this, I will pass it over to Eric, who will walk you through a few more business implications. Thank you, Ken. The next implication is around the growing need to accelerate e-commerce and digital marketing efforts. We're all aware of the importance of e-commerce, but now we need to understand that the consumer journey just got more complex. But shoppers' expectations is that their experiences are consistent, both online and offline. In this scenario, I want to touch on a couple of key takeaways. The need to deepen our relationships with our e-commerce partners and developing and investing in your own e-commerce platform, be it in the form of a marketplace on a third-party site or developing your own brand platform for e-commerce. While e-commerce is growing significantly, in-person shopping is still important. 60% of consumers are still visiting stores. 14% are buying online, and 26% of consumers are shopping equally online and offline. Or sorry, in-store. Apart from online, small independent mom and pop stores have been or have seen a revival with double-digit growth across all channels. Interestingly, all the trends that we've talked about earlier are already happening at retail. 
We're seeing the nested trend with growth of things like home appliances and spices, health and wellness with growth in cough, cold, meds, vitamins, and supplements, and monitors and webcams for home setups. On the flip side, categories that are declining are based on the external environment. Overall, brick and mortar retail has taken a huge hit and it's projected to continue over the next few years with three factors shaping this. Weak demand and a recessionary economy, strong e-commerce growth, and a reduction in physical stores. If we break this down by channel, food, discount, and mass will continue to see growth uh, in consumer demand of varying degrees with the impact of e-com adoption and footprint impact. What does this mean for retailers? What are the do's and don'ts that they need to focus on during and post COVID era? Enforcing physical distance will be important both in the short term and for the foreseeable future. Industrial level cleaning will be a cost of doing business. Ensuring products are in stock are more, is more important today than it was in the past. Having staggered shopping hours, especially to accommodate seniors. Protecting your employees and having enough PPEs and sanitization stations. Some retailers have moved quickly and installed protective shields at checkouts. We can expect to see more actions like this. And of course, having alternative fulfillment options. Here's a snapshot of retailers that are doing it right and those that are struggling. With the volatility in business planning and shifts in channel and customer strategies, we'll need, to, we'll need a new supply chain playbook. The focus will be on building resilience in our trade networks and an emphasis on diversification and creating trusted relationships and partnerships. We'll have to closely monitor demand to manage our inventory. Sourcing local will take on a new meaning and importance. And with that, I pass it back to Nilo. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. So let's now look at some other areas of the business uh, that are being impacted as a result of the new normal coming into play. So we'll start by taking a look at media, media and advertising habits. We've all been home for a few weeks now. Our media consumption has gone up significantly. You know, we have seen that uh, we are spending a lot more time in front of the TV, spending more time on our devices, be it our cell phone, our uh, iPads, and we are consuming media from every single direction while being at home. So as a result, marketers have realized that they really don't need to spend that much money to grab your attention because you're already there. And as a result, 63% of marketers have said they have reduced their ad spending. But this doesn't mean that's going to stay the same moving into the second half of this year of 2020. It, there will be a revival and there will be a change back to the original levels that we are anticipating uh, uh, we had pre-COVID as well. But one neat thing that I really want to point out here on the left side of this chart is around the media mix. So the interesting thing to note here is that live news and TV has seen a revival. As a result of this crisis, people are coming back to their perceived authentic source of information rather than, say, using their Twitter account or their social media feeds to give them the latest update. They're going to that perceived authentic source of information. So here I want to say, make your media decisions based on data, but also keep in mind where your consumers are from a need state perspective. Think back to you know, the curve, the crisis curve that we looked at early on in the presentation. That will give you a sense of what are those things that people are, are thinking about? What are their needs at this particular point in time? And how do you connect with them? And we'll touch on that a bit more further in this presentation because that is going to be very important. How you talk to your consumers and what you say to them will make or break their relationship with your consumer base. Trust is going to play a very key role. I, I touched on this earlier as well a bit. Uh, um, we know that ethical uh, drivers will be very critical. In fact, brands and businesses that are showcasing authenticity, integrity, purpose, and dependability will be three times more likely to attract consumers and shoppers to them versus their competitive set. So an important thing to note here is the 
trust and loyalty that all brands have been struggling for uh, for many years now, this is the time to make sure that you're portraying it the right way and grabbing those consumers. There's a global study that was done by Euromonitor that's on the right side of the screen here. 51% of connected consumers globally say they only buy from companies and brands that they trust completely. 67% of connected consumers globally said that friends and family recommendations are extremely important in influencing their purchase decision. So things to keep in mind as you're building out your marketing strategy for the new normal. Because trust is already starting to manifest itself across categories. For example, if you're in the food and beverage category, the trust that people place in this category has jumped up to the number one position. It used to be at the number seven position pre-COVID, and now uh, that was in January 2020 when this research was done, and when it was redone in April, food and beverage jumped up to the number one position. And like we were talking about earlier in the previous slide, your inner circle of influence is going to be the place where you're going to gravitate towards for information for information uh, and, sorry information and guidance to help with your purchase decisions be it online or offline you're going to be looking to those immediate influencers family friends to help you with your decision making and consumers are also looking for hyper personalization this trend is especially important uh, and i would say pretty much every business, every brand is going to be looking at the Gen Z and the millennials because those are very important demographics to have in your, uh, to have in your area and uh, uh, loyal to you because they are spending the most as you saw in one of the slides that Ken had presented. So especially with those uh, consumers, here's a very good example that from a Brazilian retailer that actually did a phenomenal job with this. The retailer's name is Magalu, and they started a virtual avatar called Lou. She humanizes the online shopping experience. She gives product recommendations, she provides customer service, and in fact, in the social space and the digital space, you'll find her everywhere. So what they have now done is they have actually personalized and put a human presence to this virtual avatar, now Lou is uh, seen at some of the large events that happen around uh, Brazil. So something to think about and look at the disruptive uh, ideas that are coming from some of these uh, innovative companies around the world. But keep in mind that consumers are looking more and more for a personalized experience. Gone are the days of a generic mask ad being put out on TV. It no longer will cut it for you. And the reason I say that is because we are starting to see these trends of engagement and connectedness from consumers everywhere, especially more so now during this COVID-19 crisis. 54% increase in the number of reviews in April versus last year. This is from a recent Bazaar Voice research that was done. So people are writing more reviews about your products and services, and they are asking questions of brands more 32% more questions being asked of brands. And now if you're a brand and a business, the expectation is that you will get back to them within 24 hours or less. Actually, how you manage your digital consumer journey is a whole other topic. But one quick soundbite that I want to leave you with here is do respond to reviews, be it a positive review or a negative review. It shows that you care. It shows that you are willing to make that connection with your consumers and you want them on your side. So make that effort and believe me, it will take you a very, very long way. And as we are navigating this new normal, a new term has come about and I re really want you to start thinking about this. Think about the soul of your brand and I'm consciously using this word soul and I'm not calling it the brand DNA or the brand architecture because Brands that are considered soulful are perceived as being soulful in connecting with their consumers, with their customers, will have a significant advantage in the new normal and it will help them win in the new normal. Because you need to be where your consumers are, you need to be uh, in the need state that they want you to be in. 
and talk to them in the language that resonates with them. That's very critical. Connect with your customer's passion. Understand them and then connect with them. So here I want to take a minute to first of all acknowledge that as, so, uh, as society, uh, all of us have paid a huge toll. Uh, many of us have lost loved ones uh, to this COVID-19 crisis. And now, as we are starting to look into the new normal, we are starting to think about, you know, the positive things that could come out of this crisis. We're starting to look for that silver lining to this very big dark cloud that forced us to reset our uh, world in every single aspect that we are aware of. And this actually becomes an opportunity, an opportunity that innovators had been waiting for for many years to make that leap, that next level of growth and take your, their organization to that next level of growth. We are seeing shifts in behaviors. We are seeing new regulations being put out there. We are seeing an accelerated adoption of technology. So all of these coming together become the perfect moment for you to revive and reinvent yourself and your business. And in this me next meme that I want to share with you, makes it really interesting because when you think about digital transformation, a number of organizations were talking the talk but really not walking the talk over these past few years. However, they have had to make some changes very quickly. And I'm sure you've seen this meme, but it's so funny and so pertinent that I really have to share it with you. Who led the digital transformation of your company? Was it your CEO? Was it your chief technology officer? Uh-uh, it was COVID-19 that actually led a number of businesses kicking and screaming into the new world uh, of digital transformation. So this is something to keep in mind, especially as you start thinking about, you know, uh, uh, how do you take this to the next level? Acting boldly, ensuring that you are making bold decisions early on will really help your business get to the next level. Because keep in mind, the playing field is not even. There were some businesses that had a head start that were looking ahead and knew that digital transformation is going to be very critical. They have already had a head start. If you're making this, uh, this crisis as your starting point, then you need to work fast. You need to act quickly. And uh, another thing that you need to also focus on is to invest and innovate. R&D is something that we try to put off for uh, when the business is doing well or when we are having a good uh, uh, year but actually the top 100 most innovative companies tend to spend more during a recession resulting in accelerated growth and accelerated profitability as well as you can see on the right side of the screen so instead of cutting funding to innovation and r d i would urge businesses to use this time to invest in innovating and thinking differently and changing the trajectory of growth for your business. Because in a crisis, the best defense is offense. It's a mindset shift that we are urging businesses to take on. Because as we quickly move from being defensive to offensive, I'm not saying we need to forget that you have to manage your risks, the health and safety of your teams, or keeping a close eye on your PL. All of those things are still very important but they can't be your sole focus. The rapid pace of change means that those that adapt to these changing times will thrive. Those that can't or won't will no longer be relevant. So don't be the blockbuster of the industry. Don't be the Kodak of the industry. Be the Netflix, be the Alibaba that actually grew during the previous SARS outbreak. They are today a $470 billion e-commerce giant. So have that mindset of being offensive and making those changes that are needed quickly and decisively. Those will be the traits of winners in this new normal. And here are some really interesting examples. Uh, I won't go through every single one, but as we've been uh, curating and looking at some of the examples of emerging disruptors that have actually used their current core business to tweak it and pivot quickly to start tapping into new channels or new markets or new offerings are doing extremely well. 
So this is how you should be thinking. So I'll just take one example here. You'll have the uh, presentation so you can like, uh, look at the rest. But the first one on this slide is a company called Emmy Controls. They make snow cannons. Very early on in the year, they realized that there's going to be a steep drop in demand. And they quickly modified, they re-engineered and retooled their equipment so that it could be used to disinfect large open spaces. Hey, we all know that disinfecting uh, health and hygiene is going to be very important in the new normal. And these disruptors that are staying on top of the trend are doing the right things by their business and pivoting. So many more examples, both here in Canada, in the US, as well as globally that we can look at. And I have another whole presentation that we can look at from uh, a, an innovation perspective. But just to get you thinking and giving you some thought starters here, if you don't want to go into a net new green field white space, you can do a lot with your core business as well. You just need to be cognizant of what those opportunities are and the ones that you want to tap into. So which gives, takes me to my next example. We have businesses of different size and scale and scope out in the market and within our group as well, we have participants from across the spectrum of industries and uh, uh, sizes of companies. But speed and agility is something that's going to be common regardless of your size and scale. It is going to be very important and a competitive ad advantage in the new normal. PepsiCo, we all know, is a huge organization. It's a huge global multinational. Well, they took 30 days to come up with two new direct-to-consumer platforms, snacks.com and pantryshop.com. So it is doable. You know we have all been in meetings similar to this where we have taken many, many, many meetings to come up with a decision or have just been going in circles. So, yeah, I understand what you're seeing out of this picture. I have been there on the other side of the line as well. But the neat thing is, based on this research that was done by, Kate, by uh, McKinsey with uh, 100 executives from the CPG retail industry, what we are noticing is that the pace of decision making has accelerated. So we need probably maybe one to five meetings at the most to make a decision and move on. So developing a consumer facing website is the easy part. It's developing the systems and processes in the back end to uh, deliver against the consumer experience. That's the difficult part. But the true, true difficult part for a number of organizations is the culture, the internal politics. Trying to get things moving is something that we will all have to relearn, unlearn and relearn, actually, because if you are not keeping pace, you will no longer be relevant. So as we're evaluating new areas of growth, be it net new innovation or areas to build around your core business, you want to make sure you're, that you're doing your due diligence, that you're evaluating the opportunity from the point of view of fit. Because there are a few things that you have to be aware of before you make that leap uh, into a new idea or a new concept or a new way of working. You have to try and evaluate, does the access to the market uh, uh, really makes sense? Do we have those existing relationships and partnerships? Is there a fit with the current strategy? Does this fit in with our investment policies that we have within the organization? What about the available assets? Do we have the resources in terms of team, technology, uh, manufacturing capabilities, logistics, all of those in place? If the answer to any of these is yes, then the next question that you need to ask yourself and your organization is, what is the appetite for change? Yes, there might be a need for investments from the point of view of learning new technologies or investing in new technologies. Are we as an organization, keeping in mind the size of the price, willing to make that investment? So that's that next level of questioning. In fact, I just want to quickly touch on something that we have as one of our products. I won't spend more than 10 seconds on this, I promise. Uh, it's called InnovMap. It's a complete innovation ecosystem. And one of the components of this ecosystem is around opportunity assessment. Here we look at opportunities and ideas through three key lenses, attractiveness, viability, and feasibility. So that's the kind of responsibility you want to have 
to be able to ensure that you're not going after every shining object that's out there. You want to be conscious and responsible with bringing in new ideas. You definitely need to innovate. You definitely need to pivot. But you need to do that being responsible for uh, the outcomes as well. So when we look at uh, various areas of growth, uh, every business is at a different place. You know, every organization is at a different starting point. So I want to share with you a few different scenarios. So if you look at this matrix on the X axis towards the zero point, you see, keep your existing offering. And on the other end of this X axis, you see, find new offerings. And on the Y axis, closer to the zero point, you see, keep existing clients in market. And on the other end, you see, find new clients and markets. So what does this mean? So when you're looking at moving away from your core business model, this will mean that you will have to be making your way towards a new business model, a new way of working. You could potentially be moving away from, say, a B2B to B2 business model into B2C business model. You're probably a B2C company and you're also looking at the omni-channel strategy and going, okay, now I need to have a direct-to-consumer, a D2C business model embedded into my overall uh, business model now. So those are the kind of things that you need to think about. And yes, of course, if speed is of essence, then acquisitions in white spaces is also something that you can consider. So if you're a business that wants to truly win and thrive in the new normal, there will be a need to have some specific growth interventions put in place. And here I want to talk about three key growth interventions, the when to grow, the where to grow, and how to grow. When we talk about when, this is a time frame, a very finite time frame, especially when you're talking about coming out of a crisis and recovering. You have a window of two years to make sure that what you're trying to achieve gets completed in those two years. You can't wait for three, five years out because the opportunities will be gone by then. The second is around where to grow, the reallocating resources to existing businesses, making sure that we are moving into adjusting uh, adjacent categories, adjacent industries uh, is something that you could look at. You can also expand into high growth geographies as well. So as we know, we have got the emerging markets that are continuing to grow even in this uh, uh, pandemic. So, you know, that's something that you could also consider. And the how to grow, of course, uh, building new capabilities to enhance productivity. You saw the example of ME Controls, the company that makes snow cannons. They were able to retool quickly and come up with a new use for their existing equipment. So you could do that. You could access high growth customer segments or even think about uh, M&A programs. And when I say m and I'm using this term loosely here. It does not only talk about mergers and acquisitions. We are living in a collaborative economy, uh, you know, a gig economy. Everything that is uh, a shared economy and builds off collaboration is doing extremely well. So you know what? Think about m and with a broader lens of collaboration and joint ventures as well. And with that, I want to bring it back to the one slide that was the catch-all that we started with. So with this, we want to say that the key takeaway for this webinar, if you remember anything, is as a business that's looking to get to the next tipping point of growth, the time is now. The time is now to reinvent and revive your business. And by focusing on four key areas, you can easily achieve that. Understanding the new normal, remapping your current business, innovating and expanding into new growth areas, and creating a mindset of growth, of creating a culture of innovation across the entire spectrum of your organization. And believe me, you will be able to take your organization to that next level of growth. And with that, I want to just spend a few minutes, actually one minute, on just talking to the three key products that we have that can help you take, get to that next level of growth. We focus on three key areas, strategic planning with our product called Stratopedia. This is a proven vision-based strategic planning model that will help you turn around your baseline business and accelerate the pace of growth. 
We can also help you with your restart plans for 2020 and 2021. The second product is called InnovMap. I talked about this very briefly early on in the presentation. This is a complete ecosystem that will help make your innovation outcomes more predictable, incremental, and profitable. And our uniqueness is underpinned by the fact that we use a scientifically proven coaching framework to help drive high performance across your organization and engagement across all areas of the organization. So early on in this presentation, Ken mentioned this crisis has impacted every single area of our business. So we want to make sure that every single cross-functional team is pulling in the right direction that we are talking the same language. There is a sense of shared goals and shared wins. You want to break down the silos. You want to articulate your objectives and strategies seamlessly to the entire organization. So do reach out. We would be very happy to help you with this. 